been going on a while. We were meant to have a big hoo-ha for our 100th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And the film was going to be part of it, which all got lost in the fog of COVID. As I think a lot of you got a lot of things lost in the fog of COVID. Um, so we're, we're thrilled. We're really thrilled to, to view this today. And we really are... The 100 year is cool, no two ways <laughs> about it. But the best part, I, certainly for me personally, and I think for our board as a whole, is the recognition of the work that's being done by those that are, we are so fortunate to partner with, by our grantees. And as you all know, this film is, a, is really about organizing. You know, what is it? How does it work? Why do we think, and we will, it's so effective. And for me, it's been a really interesting, I've been on the board for um, a long time. <laughs> so I think about when I first joined the board and trying to understand what this thing of organizing was. And has it evolved over time? I think absolutely. I think it's changed the face. The faces have changed, obviously. The, the tenor sometimes, you might say, has changed. I got the greatest question today um, by this gentleman in the front row. Does the word organizing hamper you? That wasn't exactly what you said, but I'm close. And my, re my reply was, I get what you're, totally get what you're saying, but what am I gonna replace it with? Because the thing that's so intriguing for me about organizing is that it is truly tapping in to all the potential that is out there in communities that has Many, much of that potential has been hidden under the rug, unseen, and not been given a voice. So when I think of organizing that's effective, I think of those voices, I think of individual changes, and I'm sure we all have stories about seeing the changes in individuals that have come from becoming to be participating and organizing and what it's done for them as individuals. And we see what it's done for community. So as much as it's, uh, it is not something where you can count meals given or money raised or a lot of things you can't, you can't put numbers on. But the success that has come from these, or, these organizations is nothing short of miraculous for me and the amazing stories that we hear. And I think sometimes organizing can be a little scary of a word. Like, what the heck does that mean? And what issues are being dealt with and how? And who's on first? But watching what effective organizing has done, which I'm hoping is what is gonna be portrayed here in the film tonight, has been a terrific, terrific journey for the foundation and for me personally. And I'm hoping for all of you um, to see tonight, get a better feel for it. And I know this film is going to probably raise more questions, which is the, great. And you'll be hearing from Joanza, our fantastic executive director, and also the gentleman that produced the film and sort of what some things that he kind of thought about and realized after having done this film for us. So thanks again for coming. Hey, everyone. Oh, Thank it. you so much What's for being doing? here. Um, I'm Fernando Avila, uh, video strategist and producer at Social Impact Films. I am used to being behind the camera. <laughs> and when I am in front of the camera, I usually have a teleprompter, so um, I'm going to have to use some of these notes here. Um, but, um, you, know, I, when, you know, I was thinking about um, this film, and I was thinking about like how from the very beginning of my filmmaking career, my goal has been to tell the stories of people that don't often have their stories told and to do it in a thoughtful manner, right? And, um, you know, I've spent 14 years working with nonprofit organizations and telling their stories and the, the stories of the people that they serve. And, you know, um, I've been able to do that. <laughs> I've been able to tell those stories and to uh, meet people in, in our communities and, and, and tell those really powerful stories. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, 
something that has been um, that has really stuck out to me um, has been um, that over these years I've learned um, that what I actually do is I capture humanity and everything that's that that involves humanity right the love the challenges the triumphs of people right and um, that's uh, very special to me uh, so when Joanza asked me to say a few words about my approach to this film uh, I really thought about uh, the framework that I use to prepare for any film or video that I create and really ultimately what that is is you know, I wanted to honor the stories of the people that I was working with uh, uh, to make this film. And I wanted to do it in a way where it would bring out their, um, uh, the very genuine, honest, um, and an intimate portrait of, of, who, of who they are, what they do. Um, so part of that framework is to sort of work with them um, to do these pre-production interviews that really are in essence them sort of teaching me what it is that they do, who they are, what their life is about and um, and for me to take that knowledge and the next step is to, for me to create a guiding outline but using their words and their ideas and not putting myself in that in that film, right? Um, <clears throat> And then from there, I have my team that is amazing, that um, we sort of go out and we, uh, you know, sort of um, are rooted in, in this respect for the thoughts and ideas that people have. And that, you know, this framework is incredibly important to me. Um, <clears throat> so additionally, um, thinking about the specific people that I worked with for this film, uh, something that was really impactful uh, to me was just thinking about how um, passionate, thoughtful uh, uh, they are about their work uh, organizing and how, you know, how that's sort of part of who they are. And it's something that's not easily like just like um, the work that they do isn't, isn't, something that you can remove from their, from, from their identity uh, so easily, even if tomorrow they decided to do something completely different. Uh, that's, that's who they are. That's what informs their work. And um, I think that's beautiful. I think it's awesome. And they, they were amazing to work with. I wish Pastor Jeff could be here as well, but um, uh, I guess with that, you know, Enjoy the film. Thank you so much for being here. I don't consider myself an organizer. I do recognize when I look at what the definition of an organizer is that I am that. Uh, but I'm not that by training, nor am I that by education. I'm that because I'm in a position of leadership and I was called on to address an issue. The issue touched my heart and I started seeking to address it. Once you get into addressing issues, and for me, because I saw some level of movement, e even if it wasn't complete, what I would consider complete success, it gave me the understanding that I can make a difference. I feel like every organizer is an activist, but not every activist is an organizer, if that makes sense. A lot of like, when I think of like activism, it's like them calling out things that are wrong, which I think is great and like needed. 
Um, but I feel like it's a spectrum of things. Organizing is a lot more like direct action and adding pressure through the collective and people power. I would say organizing is building power, collective power, where you're bringing together people from you know, a variety of different backgrounds or a variety of different experiences who want to see the same thing. It can be one small thing that everybody has in common that they want to see change, or it can be a big thing. My name is Pastor Jeffrey Campbell, and I'm the pastor of the Woodlawn Baptist Church in the Woodlawn community, but I'm the chairman of the Board of Trustees at the Lagoon Burns Hope Center in the Bronzeville and Greater Chicago community. This community, when I grew up in it, had the seeds of the gang movement in the black community. And unfortunately for me, the street that's right to our east, the Woodlot Avenue, was the dividing line between two gangs. And I can remember spending one summer in the house, the whole summer, I could not go out because they were recruiting on my block. And so I grew up in that environment. We took care of each other. We, we made sure that we were safe. Our community was like that. Uh, we knew each other. We, we, you know, there was no such thing as you were out there on your own. That's given me a sense of community and also a sense of, of what change in community could be. One of the stark memories I have from my youth in this community is Martin Luther King getting killed and soldiers driving down 63rd Street with their vehicles and their rifles. Coming across 63rd Street and I'm accosted by a Caucasian soldier with a rifle and asked, where are you going? I'm not sure anybody could understand the, the impact that that event would have on a young black man. Society needed to change and I was gonna be part of the instrument of that change. I would do everything within me to make some change happen in this society. My name is Andrea Ortiz, uh, she AI with the Brighton Park Neighborhood Council, and I'm Director of Organizing. My parents are immigrants from Mexico, really dependent on a lot of resources from the community, but it all felt like so normal. But I feel like it all changed when my dad was able to get like this union job and to get like health care benefits and like we started going to the dentist, like <laughs> we didn't need to go to the WIC anymore, like we were able to afford um, a lot of these things, so I mean kind of like lived in like multiple worlds growing up um, but also at the same time felt like it was all so very normal. Um, on my block, born and raised in Brighton Park, uh, we even normalized and like looking back like normalized a lot of like gang shootings and like gun violence in our community. I'm thinking back of like instances of trauma <laughs> that have kind of like burst my happy bubble or like reality bubble growing up. She was my favorite social studies teacher who made me debate another white student. It was during Obama's election when he was first running. Um, it was like he was seeking like the nomination against Hillary. My teacher was like, oh, I have two people to debate and I like, love history and I'm like, I love social studies. I'm like, I'll do it. Um, so she put me against another white student and we had to debate immigration. The other white students started like talking about like immigrants taking jobs and it just took me aback how my teacher like stood up and like stood in favor of like what this white student was saying and like agreed with him and just like those instances on top of like other instances with like other folks um, and like encountering like xenophobia when I'm with like my family or having to translate for my parents growing up. I feel like really, really highlighted how different I was from everyone else. My name is Grace Pye. 
I work for Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago and I'm the executive director. I was born and raised in the LA area in a very Asian American community. I grew up just surrounded by a community that really reflected my identity. And so I think that really does something to shape how you think about yourself, like that young. At least my ethnic and racial identity, even my gender identity, was not something that was used to single me out or to, you know, target me in a negative way, but that it was actually like celebrated. I did not grow up in a particularly political family. So for me, the process of becoming politicized and getting involved in organizing came in college, which is when I moved to Chicago. And the first campaign I ever got involved in was the campaign to close the two coal plants that used to exist in Pilsen and Little Village. And so I started from a place, I would say, of a very kind of do-gooder mentality. Like, you know, I'm a privileged college student, I'm in a position to be able to help, and let me just learn more about what I can do. I can do something about the situation. And so that's kind of how I would describe part of my experience of politicization. You know, just that I had that kind of light bulb go off um, where I realized that I could do something to create a change. The key to being a good organizer is to be a good listener. As you walk among the people, just in casual conversation, people are going to share with you what's troubling them. The power of organizing rests in the ability of one person to hear another human being and be willing to step in and help that person do whatever it is they want to do. Sometimes it's helping them realize they do have value. That's often where it can start. But if you, if you aren't doing that kind of work, you aren't organizing. If that person is the same three years down the road, you haven't done organizing. If that same person isn't recruiting other people and helping to take that person through the same transformation, you are not organizing. Even though we're organizers, the way that every organization organizes is very different. So like, what do we need to do to help get us our win? So if we're looking at it through a roadmap, we're here and then winnings will be here. What's the path we need to take to win? So it could look like setting up a meeting to talk about the issue, um, developing a school-wide survey that you could use as data to show to the person you're talking about. There's different escalations, there's like different tactics and with every escalation, brings more and more awareness to the issue or the campaign that you're fighting against um, and adds more pressure to whoever your target is. So there are some basics that, that, that you know, are just the base of what you, you're seeking to accomplish. And that is, what's the goal? What's the path or the, the, the things that are necessary to happen to accomplish the goal? And what is seen as the goal being accomplished. Because sometimes you get so busy trying to make things happen that you forget that they have happened. Because as things start going on, more and more gets added into it. So it's good to sit down initially and say, okay, this is what we're trying to accomplish and this is what it looks like when it is accomplished. Now, what does it take to get there? Whatever I need to legally do to get it done is what organizing is about. And so for me, organizing could be pressure, could be applying pressure, but my preference is that it be about negotiation to begin with. If you can't agree then, or you're too far apart, then you have to begin to look at okay, what is it that we can get accomplished? And sometimes that requires compromise, but sometimes that requires putting pressure on them that would allow them to understand that this isn't going away. And so I don't think it's all pressure, and I don't think it's necessarily all layers of pressure. I think that pressure is one of the tools 
for getting to what the organization or what what is being organized around. But I think you also have to have other tools in your uh, satchel to get it done. You know, you have to have a specific demand to be able to measure whether you've gotten it or not. If you have something vague, like, you know, I wanna improve public education, how do you measure whether you've actually gotten that thing or not? Right, so something big, a big idea like that, we have to break down into something concrete. Something where you would know, yes or no, did we get it or not? Once you've figured that out, then I think it's easier to determine things like, well, who can give us that? Who has the power to do that? And so I think, you know, that kind of guides the process then of figuring out the how. What do we need to do to get that person who has that decision-making power to do the thing that we want them to do? And that's where the building power piece comes in, right? Do we have enough people organized, enough money organized to be able to change that person's decision-making, you know, process. You spend five seconds around organizers, you're gonna hear people talk about money power versus people power. Because in this society, we've associated power with money. It is the reality. People who have the most money, in theory, have the most power. The need for profit for the investors creates the, the issue with, with finding the funding. The profit motive hinders doing things that are altruistic. Who wants to help the poor? And then, when there is funding available, they make you jump through so many hoops to even get on the radar of the funders that a lot of great ideas go unfunded. Right, there's instances where I've seen communities ask for $25,000, just throwing a number out there. Through that conversation, it's obvious they need way more than $25,000, but that's what they're comfortable asking because of the imbalance power dynamic. And we're able to go back and say, you know what, let's give them a little bit more because we're able to. But then let's also have conversations with some of our colleagues who are able to give so that they get closer to what their actual goal is. That's the kind of philanthropy we embrace at the Weibo Foundation. That's the type of philanthropy we should see happen across the world, where it really is about us stepping out of our ivory tower and walking among the people to hear what the needs are and to resource them at the amounts that they actually need, not what they think they can just get. Who I'm fighting for, I think, was a question that I struggled with for a long time. That it was easier for me to identify the injustices in the world that I wanted to play a part in changing, but that the for whom was a little bit of a struggle. You know, having come from a place that was very Asian American, where I always kind of felt at home, in Chicago that was less clear. You know, I think because of the kind of dominant narrative about race relations in the country being very black and white, I kind of wondered, like, how do I fit into this? You know, like, what is my role? So I think it really was kind of when I made the shift to working in the Asian American community that I became a lot more grounded in who my people are. I mean, I do it for my people. Um, I do it for like the village that always like has my back and like my community. Um, in this like work, it's like really hard. You almost never win. And when you do winning feels like losing is what I've come to like see firsthand. I don't know what my larger purpose is, but the movement could use me however the movement wants to use me, and I'll be totally okay with that. I honestly believe that it is our responsibility 
to do the best that we can with that that has been entrusted with us. And I count that as this entire world. And so I'm fighting for this world to be the best that it can be. That's, that's, and this organizing is just one of the tools. Church, my religion is just one of the tools. Family is one of the tools to make this world a better place. And then the second part of who I'm fighting for is myself and my progeny. I'm fighting for us. I want them to inherit something better than what I had. As long as that willingness to resist is there, as long as that desire to build a better future is there, there will always be hope. And not some empty sense of hope, right? Like, oh, I wish one day. But to actually say, what I do today will make a difference. And to go and do that, and do it with another human being. So that the vision you have, that dream you have, can actually become a reality. We've seen an incredibly just scary and horrific rise in anti-Asian racism over the last year. And I think that did contribute to, you know, people's political will to support an effort like ours. This past year, we led a campaign to pass an Asian American history requirement in the state legislature, and we won. And I think to some people it looks like, wow, like how did you do that so quickly? You know, how did you get that big win in such a short period of time? You know, and it is a really significant victory that of course is part of a legacy of years and years and years of different state legislative work, not all of which was successful, that helped us build the relationships needed to get that across the finish line. I had asked a student, hey, there is this press conference. Do you want to like speak? And she was like, no, but I've never emceed a press conference before. And I'm just like, <laughs> you want to emcee? And she's like, yeah. You know you're a good organizer when you organize yourself out of a job. You have been able to support leaders to grow into their power. So then they're the ones who are organizing and bringing other folks in. So we have like a lot of our youth organizers started off as like youth leaders and are now organizing within the campaign and bringing folks in. And it's just really great to see that grow and that transition happen. One of the things that I find hope in is that you don't actually need to organize everybody to be able to win. A relatively small group of people can have a huge impact. You know, it's like 3.5% or something like that. You know, there's some, somebody has written something about the number of people that you need to kind of tip the scales, and it's small. That, to me, gives me hope. My goal is to see how we're able to continue to make policy and everyday life things that impact us a lot more accessible to our community, that we are continuing to create systems of accountability to hold our elected officials and our own community accountable to these processes, um, and that we are finding time to celebrate with joy. The Bible tells the story of the Tower of Babel. And in the Tower of Babel, all of the land was of one language and in one mindset. And they decided to build a tower and go up to the heavens to see what was going on up there. And the scripture says God came down and looked at that tower and looked at the people building it and said, now the people are one. And if they continue as one, there's nothing that they can't do. According to the Bible, God acknowledged that when men come together, there's nothing that they can't do. That's what the future holds. That's what we as organizers need to be focused on, bringing us together, getting rid of the things that make us different 
and bringing us together. And then all of the other things that are angst to us, that, that create havoc amongst us, we can deal with. just a, a brief conversation uh, with the stars of the film so I'll ask them to come forward please and think about the questions you might have in your mind as they come forward please don't be shy right pick a seat so again my name is Juwan Malone I'm the executive director uh, for the Weibo Foundation Thank you. <laughs> uh, and so we have, again, the stars of the film. That is not Reverend Jeffrey Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the anniversary of Reverend Campbell's mom's passing. Uh, so he wanted to take the day uh, for himself. So the executive director of the Eugenia Burns Hope Center, Mr. Rob Wilson, is here in this place. Uh, we have Andrea Ortiz, again, who you remember from the film. Patrick Brosnan, the executive director, <laughs> uh, is here in the front row. And Grace Pye, uh, executive director at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Chicago. And Song, the organizing director, is also here. There's a few questions, uh, just a couple questions, actually, that I have for them. Just to get the conversation going, but I want you to ask your questions, right? Is, is why we're here. This is a chance for us to see them in action, but then to talk to them, right? So I, I want to just really first um, ask for your, like your thoughts, right? This is your first time seeing the film, right? So this is their first time seeing it, so surprise <laughs> to them. Uh, and it was started Grace. I mean, what, what did you think of it? No, I thought, you know, I think there aren't a lot of articulations of what organizing really means the kind of building blocks of it and so I found it kind of um, a helpful just framing of that and I found a lot of commonality between you know what the three of us had said um, and so much of kind of how I approach my organizing in what other folks shared even if the way that we do it day to day is not necessarily the same um, and so yeah I think that's kind of what stood out to me. Andrea? Um, it was, I'm amazed that it was hours of filming. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have feelings about that? Andrea? No, I don't. <laughs> but I'm just very amazed and grateful for all the work to condense it in 20 minutes. And I could only imagine, like, I thought this was really fruitful. And I could only imagine, like, how much more fruitfulness is in those hours of so I'm, I'm really excited and really happy to see how our experiences have impacted the way that we organize and continue to organize and engage in our communities. Thank you. Rod? Man, it was great. I thought it was a real good foundational piece on organizing. Uh, it's my first time seeing it. I wasn't a part of it, so I didn't know <laughs> what to expect. Uh, but I uh, do appreciate, you know, Rep you know, standing in for Reverend Campbell and, you know, what he saw in me and being able to come to the Hope Center. Because Reverend Campbell is um, a visionary, but real community person, real community person. And, and I think he has helped me see, you know, the, the, the beauty in that in a sense that, you know, all of our organizers at the Hope Center come from the community. We don't hire seasoned organizers. You know, we're looking how do we transform our community, how do we take the people we have and, and build them up. And I think that's kind of, it com comes out in this. Mm -hmm. And so now there's a very foundational piece on organizing. Yeah. So speaking for the foundation, one of the things we wanted to do with the film mm -hmm. 
was to really help dispel some myths, mm -hmm. right? People have conceptions mm -hmm. of what organizing is, right? The idea that you're used to seeing on television people yelling at somebody else, mm -hmm. right? Kind of mobbed up, and so that's what you think organizing is. But it's so much more. And so without getting into the distinctions between activism versus organizing or mobilization or any of these things and just turn into some academic exercise, we really wanted to root it in the lives of the people who are engaged in the process. And so I just again want to ask for those of us as funders, right, who are considering um, funding organizing as part of our strategic priorities, right? We may be there, we may not be there. What recommendations do you have for us? Again, as people steeped in it, what do we need to understand about organizing? And whoever wants to start can go first. I'm happy to kick us off. Um, you know, I think, I think this was touched on in the film, um, or maybe it was before the film, but I think there's something about how you capture the impact of organizing that can be difficult to quantify in numbers or put into words. And I've found that, you know, with this kind of emergence of what I understand to be this new kind of term, trust-based philanthropy, <laughs> there has been more openness from some of the funders that we work with to have conversations. And I think the impact of organizing is really well understood through stories, right? Because I think maybe it was Pastor Jeff who said this in the film, Knowing that an individual started in one place but did not end at that same place is really an illustration of the impact. And writing that into a narrative can be a little bit difficult to capture fully, but hearing it from somebody, you know, either speaking to a young person whose life was transformed by organizing, you know, in a meeting or in a virtual Zoom, you know, site visit or something like that can help to really illustrate that impact in a way that I think is a little bit more accessible to those of us who are trying to raise money for this work, you know, rather than having everything kind of in the written word. Um, and so I think that's something to think expansively about. You know, how can you maybe change some of the metrics that you use to evaluate, you know, a potential grantee? I agree with everything Grace said. Like, how do you measure something that is potentially life or death for our community members? Mm -hmm. And when we're coming and saying like, this is what needs to happen. And we're like the frontline um, folks for a lot of our community members. Like we hope that there's that, that trust for you all to believe in what we're saying. Um, Cause as you saw, like we're doing the work in our communities and these are like real life experiences that we're like uplifting for you all. I think uh, Juwan, I think you kind of said it to, in the movie that organizing is listening. And I think in philanthropy, you all have mm -hmm. to have that, mm -hmm. to hear what we're saying. I mean, it's, all, it's listening, but it's also seeing, seeing that potential, seeing that, seeing what's really there, seeing uh, um, people for not where they're at, but where they're going. Mm -hmm. and, and that takes, it takes some skill, it takes some wanting to, it takes some desire. I think it can be just this methodical piece because that's not what we do in working with folks, not at all. You know, it's, you know, seeing, you know, working with folks who don't see their own value, who don't see sometimes, not all the time, but don't see that their, their capacity to make change and helping to tap into that. I always think about, um, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I remember one of the few times I went to church, <laughs> the song, This Little Light of Mine. You know, I always think about it because all this, isms we deal with and the pr oppression, the, the threat of racism that holds this society together, it, it turns down that little light in us. It never goes out, but it, it dims it. It dims it. And then in organizing, I think, bringing those little lights together, they start to grow. They start to turn up more. People see their own agency. They see their own, what they can really do. And uh, I think that's what organizing is. But it's been able to see that potential and organizations and individuals and what we do. And, I, and that's one thing I do really appreciate about Weibo. When I got to the Hope Center and we had a $10,000 grant, that was it. And Weibo was the next grant that we got to have the faith in us uh, as the Hope Center because we may not be here. We wouldn't be here right now without having that, seeing you all seeing that in us. But I think as um, philanthropy, you got to see that in people and not just 
this, 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 these metrics, but also, also, what is that? What is that quality that we're looking for? Is that it? And how do we, you know, notice it? Can I add something to yeah. this? Because I think part of it too is also about the long game. That's right. Um, you know, Andrea and I have worked a lot, our organizations have worked a lot on the federal campaign to achieve citizenship for all. That is not a campaign that we've won. It's right. not gonna be a campaign that is easy to win, right. but the work that we do to chip away and to build our power so that when the opportunity is there that we can take advantage of it, mm -hmm. that's also critical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, while it is exciting to celebrate when we do have big policy wins, mm -hmm. It takes a lot of years of work to create that possibility and the years of work where you don't get the win are still valuable and can contribute to something larger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really key point because those system change, you know, changing the paradigms, those take time. You know, um, I, I mean, a federal campaign is something altogether, you know, different. I mean, even with us, with our around rent control, it's a multi-year thing, which, you know, we're trying to change, you know, just challenge people's understanding of, you know, the whole notion of property and I can do whatever I want with property, but is that good when you are pushing people out, you're price gouging, but that's a whole notion that's within this society that is difficult for folks to change, especially if you are legislators who are landlords, you know, that type of thing. But that's a systems change. Yeah. Elect the school board is another one. How long are we working on that? That was what? Yeah. Started with 2010, 2011, you know. It's, but so you got to be in it with us for the long haul and then see, see the growth, even though we may not cross the line, but have faith and stay with us, you know. Yeah. yeah. So I don't want to dominate the questions. I want to just open it up to see what questions you all might have. Yes, ma'am. I have a comment. And a okay. First, I just want to thank you um, because um, I got so much out of this mm. in terms of not just organizing, but um, I consider myself an organizer. I, I really resonated a lot with what the pastor said mm. about you know the, the definition of it um, as an individual. Um, but, you know, and I, I got to appreciate just how dynamic mm. organizing is. But my comment is sort of like going back to what has been said. Um, I, I used to work at a couple of foundations. And because of, and you know, one that funded community organizing. And so um, on that issue of metrics, mm -hmm. um, you know, these campaigns sometimes take years. And then how do you you know, as an organizer, as an organizing um, uh, group, you know, you're chasing one-year funding, you know, mm -hmm. because funders don't think about multi-year funding. Um, and the other thing is, um, because of the dynamic nature of it, um, you know, um, general operating. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember how groups would always say, that's our goal, because you're not pigeonholing mm -hmm. one thing or the other. Um, but I remember at the foundation one time, and this is the metrics issue, there was a very wonderful, brand new grassroots organizing group that was doing door knocking. Mm -hmm. And that was how they started off, because they really wanted to go door to door, talk to people in the community, mm -hmm. and learn from them, and find out from them what issues they cared about. Mm -hmm. And so when they brought a grant, us for funding, our board was like, don't fund them. Mm -hmm. They've not been doing anything. They've just been knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so fortunately, we were able to persuade them to do it mm -hmm. because we really, um, others in the room really felt like, how do you really represent the people yeah. and the voice of the people without going out there? And that group went on to do great things. Mm -hmm. But uh, my question is, um, since there are funders in the room, and and I'm not sure that all the funders in the room fund organizing, what do you think that funders need to hear or to know to get them to begin to think more critically about funding community organizing? Because that's mm -hmm. always been a challenge. Um, you know, God bless We Votes and all the other 
foundations that do that, but they're not enough of them. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think, maybe even if it's what are the barriers or the opportunities or even for anybody in the room, but I think that, you know, that would be a great thing because we need more money mm -hmm. going into this field. Mm -hmm. You want to take? I, th I think, um, if you're not funding, orga I mean, organizing, I think, changes any of the problems we have, I, in my opinion. If it's a programmatic change, that could be solved through organizing. You know, we do a lot of work with, uh, local school councils. Um, so we can talk about that work in many different ways. We provide training for students. You know, we can talk, we can talk about it as school improvement, cause local school councils. But for me, I'm an organizer, so I'm thinking what we're doing is connecting people all over the city under this common thing, bringing them together for, to help them improve how they do their, their role as local council, but that's organizing, that's building people together, that's building power. Now that power can then change into how do we change the school funding formula. You know, once we got those folks together, that type of thing, but we can start off with looking at a programmatic piece, but I think organizer can be seen within that. It's really being open to it and being able to see it, and I, I mean, I hate to say it, you know, and I don't hate to say it, I love to say it, but you know, it'd be great for philanthropy to be organized, <laughs> organized to be in philanthropy, then you can see the possibilities. And it's not a box, it's, it's really outside of it. Um, and, I think, and I think that's somewhat of a challenge. I think we're getting more toward that, and I'm saying it more and more, but it is, it is a little bit of a challenge because like you said, um, Deb, you know, you know, we're chasing grants year to year and then, you know, you all have to go through your uh, strategic planning goals, and then next thing you know, we're not funding this, we're funding that. And it's like, oh, here we go now, I gotta <laughs> go find this somewhere else. So that, looking at it long term, um, seeing it, you know, how, to, how we're really gonna make the real change, because, and this may not be as popular, to me, as an organizer, and as a bl black man in, in the black community, there are a million different things we can organize around. Criminalization of young people, you know, the uh, economic inequity. In our communities, we always have double-digit unemployment. Yeah, we might be at a low now, but in the white community when it's double-digit unemployment, it's a recession. We always have it, so uh, health inequity, um, poor schools, bad housing, it's a million different things. The key, though, the how we transform it is how do we bring people together help folks see that they deserve the best and they, can, and they can get that if they work together and see the value in each other. That's it, so no matter what the thing is, what the issue is, it's about the process, that process of bringing folks together. And that's a, it's a slow grind. It's not a quick thing that happens overnight because you're working with people and you're trying to transform years, decades, generations of oppression. And, but that's what it is, so the issues are you know, they are what they are, but there's a million of them because we live in an oppressive society. And so, but the process of making that change, the process of organizing doesn't change, in my opinion. And there are different ways to do it, no doubt. You know, like Reverend Campbell said, you know, it's negotiation, it's the action, civil disobedience, you know, mobilization, whatever. There's all these different tactics or whatever, but the core of it is still the same. I do think there is a lot of lack of understanding of organizing, right? It's kind of like this big black box and people don't really want to touch it because they're like, well, what is it really? And that's where I think, you know, this film is helpful in sort of laying out some of what it looks like in practice. But the other way to think about it and to kind of learn about it, if you are not an organizer, if you haven't really